Hello coaches, welcome back to another interview. This is one we did actually in 2020. We didn't release it as a podcast. It's a really, really unique topic. We talk a lot in coaching about game models, about philosophies, about analysis, about training. We don't really talk about match day and the impact you can have and maybe should you plan pre-game talks and what about the halftime and how do you navigate everything in between. So it's a really, really good topic. We wanted to bring on Dan Abrams, who I'm sure you're all aware of, worked at the highest level in professional football as a psychologist, but has also done an awful lot on the coaching side and the coaching community. So I'm sure you're aware of his work. Wanted to get him on and talk about this specific topic. How do we maximize our impact on match day as coaches? A lot around this here, a lot on preparation, a lot on review. Before we go into it, please give it a like and a subscribe. Thank you so much for the support. Here we go. The pre-game talk, yeah. when we deliver it, with so much talk today about player responsibility and ownership, how do we kind of engage them and, and lift them emotionally without, I suppose, becoming a motivational speaker and being relied upon? Let, 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 let's take a step back because when you asked me to talk about this subject, I, I really want to emphasize because, again, sense making, I, I, I want to scaffold this down, strip it back, make it nice and simple. If we think about coaching, and I talk about this in my psychosocial coaching model, we're engaged in three things, or we're delivering on three things, in my opinion engagement, so that's participation, uh, progression, which for me is learning. I want to engage players, I want to help players learn. Uh, and then the third one is performance. And for me, I'd use the word compete. I want to help players to build the capacity to compete. So when we're thinking of game day, you've got to ask yourself and sit there and write this down now. How can I help my players compete? Because that's what game day is about, isn't it? It's about competing. How do I help my players to compete? Now, everybody out there, certainly coaching at the elite adult level, the developing elite level. Let's go down to 16 plus and maybe we can filter down into maybe into some younger age groups. You have your game models, right? Which your principles of play, your, your, your tactics, your game models, whatever term you want to use for that. So obviously, you know, leading up to a game, you've got to ask yourself, how do you help players learn and then be ready to execute on those game or learn your game model. How do we then help players execute that game model? And it's that word how, isn't it? The what is the tech tack physical piece. What is the game model? How is the psychosocial piece? And I don't think anybody, very rarely we consider this. It, it's the how on that game day. How do I help players execute that game model? Get into the right frame of mind. And, and I think that it's interesting, you talked about giving players autonomy. Um, I think there's two pathways here. I think there is a directive way and I think there's a non-directive way. And I think they can also gel together. Let me explain. From a directive perspective, I'm passionate about players having a framework to their performance and to the mental side of the game. So having a performance process and having a mental process process having a performance process and having a mental process a performance process i think as a coach it's useful to help if not imperative to help players uh, create objectives that are specific okay that are as close to controllable as possible that are positive all too often i ask players what are you trying to achieve on match day on game day and they'll go well I'm trying to score I'm trying to win and it's all a bit fluffy and a bit like well we know that right what specifically are you trying to achieve you've got to help players have a performance process at one o'clock let's say we've got a three o'clock kickoff I'm being very English English Premier League three o'clock kickoff right one o'clock I want players thinking what they want to achieve from a performance perspective what is the performance process specific um as controllable as possible and positive. I think that's vital. Example, rather than a striker saying, well, I want to score, striker might say, um, constantly searching for space, getting on the end of crosses, attacking the six yard area, linking up with the midfield, things that are more specific, that are closer to controllable, that are what they want, that are positive, that are what they want. I think that that's absolutely imperative. That's what I would call a performance process. I think we have to be very, when I say directive there, I want, I, I think players need that. 
I think players need that. We need to help them. They can't just be wishy-washy and stroll in and just say, well, I want to win. That's not good enough. That is not good enough, in my opinion. I think the other side of this is a mindset process, a mindset process, and uh, knowing exactly what you want to do mentally, getting into the right state of mind, the right frame of mind. And I suppose that comes back to, you know, the motivational speech side of things that you've spoken about uh, there, Gary. And I, and I think that that You've got to be authentic to your leadership, the type of leadership you want to create. If that's you and you're great at doing that, then do that. But people have to realize or it's useful for people to realize, for coaches to realize that they don't have to do that to be able to help players get ready mentally for a game. And that's where helping players have a mental process. And that's where something like my technique of a game face can be really useful. Helping players focus on a couple of key words related to them at their best and going out and focusing on those key words, focusing on being those key words. I know a lot of the audience will have heard me talk about a game face before. That just gives a player an idea, a bit of a framework. And so when we bring it back down to back to match day, if we've got a three o'clock kickoff at one o'clock, I want players visualizing, picturing their performance process, those specific objectives. I want players to be picturing their game face, who they want to be on a pitch, how they're going to go about their business. I think that's vital. That is helping them get into the right frame of mind alone. You don't have to project your voice. You don't have, you can whisper this. You can get in amongst the players. Have you got your game face? You know, are you, uh, what are you trying to achieve today? What, you know, finding out if they've got specific controllable objectives. You can whisper this. You can have small conversations. You can have them in small groups. You can have them individually. That to me is helping players get ready more so than screaming and shouting at them or uh, uh, being motivational through your voice. Um, having players have a game face, that to me is helping, empowering players, helping them feel ready. I think that, that that is more empowering than, say, a motivational talk, in my opinion. However, if that is you, if that is authentically you, then do so. You know, you can you can deliver on a on a talk on a big speech, um, but that's got to be authentic to you, in my opinion. Very good, very good. Um, just watching the Brazil documentary on. Amazon Prime, where they've done the, they've got the TD spe speeches. Then, and interesting how he, and one of them goes down the whole line, and basically tells them. I, I mean, I, I think it's brilliant because so many, so many team talks. I would, you're thinking about the game, you're thinking about the collective. What you're saying there is to is to get into the individual. I suppose what I would ask you there is how do you kind of balance both? How do you balance the not too much detail tactically between telling three game winners that you've got to go and win us this match, whereas you've got the sub there that's saying, like, are you going to talk to me about this? For me, Gary, I think this is where you can be non-directive, and I think that this is where you've got to ask the, the, the player, players individually and as a group, what do you want from me? You've got to ask them the question, what do you want from me? On match day, who are you? What do you need? What do you require? Um, do Sorry. you... Sorry, Dan. Are you, would you would you do this at like this is youth level? This is like, hey, what do you, is this adult? Like, yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. I, I, well, I think that I think that's a really really interesting question. I don't think you do it with eight year olds, um, but I certainly think you do that with 11, 12, 13 year olds, um, because I think when when you engage them with open questions like that. Um, I think it's an underestimation of 11, 12 and 13 year olds um, that they can't engage like that. When you are engaging them like that, um, you're helping them to brainstorm and think about uh, what their needs are and their requirements are on match day. There are clearly 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds uh, at different, if I may use this term, uh, at different cognitive stages of their development. Absolutely. And if you ask an 11 year old that question and they can't answer it, it's, over, it's absolutely fine for you to offer them an answer. But if you're not engaging in that process with very young players, then you're not help. I would, I would put, I would put to people, to coaches, that you're therefore not helping them develop that cognitive side of things, that psychosocial side of things. I think that helping them engage in that at a very young uh, uh, age group can be a really, really useful thing to do. 
Um, I think that it is striking the balance between what you want to give to a player. We are going to create a game face. We are going to, we are, I'm going to uh, help you create match objectives. That is a compulsory part of what we're doing um, with asking them, what do you need from me? It's getting the balance between the two. And that's not an easy balance to strike. What do you want to give to them? What, what are you insistent on in your coaching culture? What do you want them to do on match day? What do they need from you? Where do you back off? If you've got a player who says, you know what, coach, I'd prefer it if you just let me get on with it. Absolutely fine. That's no problem at all. You let them get on with it. Um, if they're older players and they say that to you, then I think you need to set the expectations of, okay, I'll let you get on with it. Uh, I won't come up to you. I won't reinforce anything if that's what you're asking from me. But therefore, what I'm asking for you, from you is a high performance mindset and as good a delivery on your performance process, um, irrespective of me not offering reinforcement. Does that make sense? Yes. Whenever you're then going into the locker room to deliver this here I, I put a poll out that was yeah do you plan your pre-game speech to the team it's something i started doing about three or four years ago um or do you are you to go off passion again am i assuming that that's down to the expertise of the coach or sorry the experience or the whatever you're comfortable with i'd never go off passion you wouldn't no always write it down I never said you should write it down. Um, I, I'm not too sure passion is a stable trait in which to deliver messages. I'm not sure passion is a stable trait from which your players can brainstorm their own solutions if you're going to ask them questions. I'm not suggesting that you don't change tone, volume, tone and volume as you communicate to get your point across that you don't add in pauses, dramatic pauses for effect. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that working on your oratory isn't important. It is. However, you do have a game model. You do want to get points across. You do want to create an environment where players have the capacity to problem solve where you're giving them the emotional space and the brain space to be able to come up with answers if you're going to ask them questions in that moment. And if you're delivering at too high volume of, of passion, I, I'm not convinced that is the best um, environment to create. I'm not saying it should be devoid of passion. I don't think you should deliver on passion. Um. Yeah. Well, then there's a great, great kind of segue into the half time then, because when we set up our teams, we typically envision this game of high tempo, um, energetic. You know, that's why we want our teams to play. When that doesn't come in, it's a, we're almost conditioned as coaches to then spark it in ourselves in our communication. But in doing this here, do you think we can? I suppose lead ourselves down a road of shouting, screaming, and getting no information across. Okay, so it's a really, really great question, and it gives me the opportunity to get more specific here. So I've talked about a performance process involving um, specific, controllable, or as close to controllable, and positive plays. Um, a mindset process. When I talk about a mental skills framework, when I get when I go on Twitter and I talk about mental skills framework, a high performance mindset. Okay, I'm talking about three specific skills: the capacity to pay attention. Attention is a, a is a mental skill that is required. Um, the capacity to compete at the right intensity level. Attention and intensity. The psychological term for that is activation. OK, so we can be too intense, we can be under intense and we can have a sweet spot. Attention and intention, uh, uh, in intensity. Players have to pay attention. Players have to execute with intensity at the right intensity. And then players have to execute their skills, their actions with positive intent. 
So when you strip sports psychology back from a competitive perspective, and I'm saying this to your audience, when you strip competitive skills, mental skills back, for me, it's attention, intensity, intent. Okay. So you're talking about the intensity piece and those three things are joined up. Okay. So if I'm overly intense, if I'm overly aroused, horrible term that we might use in sports psychology, um, my attention might be damaged. My capacity to execute with positive intent might be poor. So intensity is a big deal. Okay. If you feel that your team and a group of individuals or an individual specifically isn't competing at the right intensity level, then you might alter your communication with that individual or group of individuals. Again, tone, volume, content. We can be louder. We can be more forceful. We can turn up the volume. Absolutely. However, content matters. Content matters. So, um, Action-based words, again, if I may say, this is where my game face can be quite powerful. Action-based words can be really useful here. Uh, words like alert, alive, lively, aggressive, upbeat, sharp, action-based words, words that are descriptive, who I want to be on the pitch. So you don't have to shout at a player who's not intense. You might ask them to be sharp, directive. You might ask them what sharp looks like in the second half, non-directive. Um, so you're asking them the question. Content matters. And for me, content matters as much, if not more so, than um, volume and tone. And also what's important here is to relate it to your game model. So if a striker example is looks lethargic and flat and you might say, OK, Joe, I've, I've no, let's be directive here. I've seen you. You're lethargic. You're flat. We've talked about this. I want you to be sharp, alive, alert, sharp, alert, alive, alert. You might repeat those a couple of times. You want him to him or her to picture that sharp, alert, alive. Can you picture that? Can you see that? Can you feel that? What does that look like? What are you doing? So we know in our game model that we want, I want you to defend from the front. For you to defend from the front, you've got to be sharp, alert, alive, sharp, alert. I want you to be sharper. I'm watching you from the sidelines. Show me sharp. Show me alert. Show me alive in the second half. I'm marking you out of 10 for that. We'll talk about that after the game. Accountability. Accountability. Maybe you can go and have a quiet chat with that person to reinforce. But again, Content matters, words matter. Words matter. So we want to use objective. That drives intensity, also drives attention. Also drives positive intent. So I think we need to get away from tone and volume as purely the isolated forerunners of intensity and understand that content matters. And if we can marry performance process with mindset process. So specifics around a game model that are specific, as controllable as possible, and as positive as possible towards what you want, not what you don't want. With mindset process, alert, alive, use your self talk, talk to yourself out there, talk to yourself out there, squash your ant, automatic negative thought, if you brought that into your environment, squash your ant, that's absolutely vital. So you can see how impactful, if you as a coach have a performance process and a mindset process, you can use that at half time. Bang, bang, short, sharp points, individual. You've got, you talked about team objectives. Have, a te have team objectives, absolutely. But make them specific. Make them con as controllable as possible and make them positive in and around your game model. Uh, and they can lead off into individual objectives, individual, individual objectives. So um, I think that intensity piece is driven by the words you use with relation to the specific objectives players in the team have with relation to the game model. And underpinning all of that, it's hormonally underpinned. It's hormonally underpinned. 
So again, as a coach, if you can get clear in your mind, and it's okay that you can't see this and necessarily see it, see it that you want to empower players, and that's testosterone and adrenaline, testosterone and adrenaline, and just staying sharp can release testosterone and adrenaline. Upbeat can release testosterone and adrenaline. Sharp alert line. Sharp alert line. Come on, your game face is sharp alert line. I want to see sharp alert line. I want to see sharp alert line second half. That's what I want. You did that last week. Sharp alert line. Testosterone, adrenaline. And then your feel-good chemicals. Endorphins. Dopamine. You don't have to know that. Feel good. Empowerment. Feel good, empowerment. Empower players, help them feel good with relation to your game model, with relation to their specific objectives. Brilliant. We've just had a really good point on, on the on the chat room. Someone's talking about two coaches then who one's the assistant coach and head coach, one's the, the positive one coming in and, and say they're delivering this message and then someone else is coming in and being in doing that with this here, what you're talking about, do you then run the risk of completely derailing all the good work by having someone who's just going to yeah, use a different set of language that's going to maybe overmine it? I think I'd want to um, drill down a bit more on what good cop and bad cop looks like because I think we're too ready to consider bad cop as the the guy or the girl who goes in and shouts the place down. And I don't think that's the bad cop. I think the bad cop can be the one who points out, who critiques, but in a, in a, in a manner that doesn't undermine the good cop and doesn't undermine the main coaching points and doesn't undermine the confidence of the player. I think the bad cop can still correct, but the the job of the bad cop is more towards what's not happening while still reinforcing what needs to happen. I think the good cop, who I suppose from a traditional standpoint might be a, an assistant coach or a couple of assistant coaches, will can then go in and reinforce what a player wants or, or what a player should be doing. Um, I think that is about co-coaching. I think co-coaching needs to be agreed beforehand as to what that process looks like. But I think that we need to not be lazy and we need to make sure, it's a great question, we need to make sure we know what a bad cop looks like specifically because that's not a sh necessarily a shouter and a screamer. That's somebody who is just critiquing more and using language relating to what's not happening more so than what is happening. The good cop is focused on what is happening. Very good. Very good. Um, Post-game analysis. Whenever, you know, again, similar to the first, similar to the we are, we draw on too much in emotion where how can we help? I suppose I've never personally been a big fan of talking to the team after games, um, but there has to be some message because you've got to leave them with, I get that there, but how can you as a coach deliver something that's going to be useful without, you know, basically, A, giving an overview of the game emotionally, or be sitting down there for 45 minutes and, and kicking every ball again with them? If you're invested in winning, if you're passionate about winning, then you work on an individual level as much as you do on a group level. If you're passionate about winning at the competitive level, which coaches claim to be, then you're as invested with, uh, at the individual level as much as you are at the team level. And too often, our processes within our coaching practice are team processes. It's a team game. I understand that. And there's not enough specifics around the individual. And the reason why I'm saying this to start the answer to this question is because 
I'd want every individual to have a process on match day, before, during, after the game. I think that's imperative. If you as a head coach can't come back to asking your people, your players, and you're all invested in winning, you're all invested in the high performance, you're all invested in a high performance mindset, I hope, you've got to have the capacity to come back to your players and go, did you stick to... You've got to have the capacity to help them have an individual plan. And then you've got to have, and that leads on to the capacity to have a conversation after a game and say, right, you've got your individual process here. You'll be experiencing a bunch of emotions right now. You know what's best for you right now. But I'm delivering, I'm always going to deliver a message after the game. So you've got to suspend that and listen to me. So you, you've got to lay down that you're going to do that whilst every individual has a way of dealing with that, dealing with the emotion of the game. That's just such an imperative. If you're invested in winning, that's, that's an imperative part of it. Match day is psychosocial. End of story. It's psychosocial. It drives everything. So you, you've got to have that. So, and then it's a simple case. I mean, there's so many ways to do it. And different coaches will have their different ways to do it. And some people online would, know better than me what's best for them but I, I i certainly think that pointing out i mean it's almost cliche to say it isn't it gary but pointing out what did go well related to the performance process as a team what did go well related to high performance mindsets what potentially needs to go better in the coming week for the to, to the next game I think that that is. Uh, I think that that is that is a useful thing to engage in, um, alongside some individual chats afterwards. If you feel that you can, if, when you know what players you can engage and you know what players you can't, then do so. You know, if Joe can list, can have a conversation, but but Jim can't have a conversation with Joe. Don't have a conversation with Jim. But every player needs an individual process. Is every player, what about the players that aren't going to, I suppose, buy in? Or I, I watched that Michael Vick 30 for 30. I don't know if you've seen it. That is a, it's an amazing, amazing insight into like how talent can actually take a player away from effective processes because he's just mega, mega talented. Different coaches trying to get him into different things and he's just 10 levels above anyone else. What if the players basically aren't committed? Because you don't see a lot of the mental work come out. In the gym, you see yourself get stronger, get better. Uh, the psych work, a lot of them, you know, will will get paid lip service. How do you you mentioned there about holding them accountable earlier on? How do you help them, give them the support, and hold them accountable to it? Are you kind of asking me at Barcelona? Would Lionel Messi have a would he be into mental skills? Would he bother? Is that kind of what you're asking me? Uh, oh, along those lines, asking you if uh, Susie on the U16 team, who's going to go on a foray to North Carolina, doesn't do it. So does Mary see the value of it? How do you get Susie to be like, all right, well, you're going to need this in two years' time. Maybe you're getting by on talent alone right now. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good question. I think every individual is going to be a different um, a different case in point. I think it starts with you as a coach and what you want for your environment, what you want for for your team, what's what's uh, valuable to you. Um, because ultimately, certainly 16 years plus, it's a team game. I know there's individual development within there. Clearly, there is. Uh, I think there's two ways to answer this. It's a tough question to answer. I think there's two ways to answer this. I think the first way is that um, if you decide as a coach that you want certain processes within your coaching practice, then those processes must be compulsory. If you've got a player who is so good, has so much skill in his or her feet, and gets by without um, 
engaging with those processes, um, then I think you've got a decision to make. I think that you either insist, I think you, you either, you're insistent because you, your culture drives this. This is what you're insistent about. This is what every player does. This is what your leadership group is driving. This is what your assistant coach is driving as well. And it doesn't matter how much skill they have in their feet. They've got to engage. Um, and often they've got so much skill in their feet. As you say, they'll get away with it. So they'll look like they're sticking to a game face. They'll look like they're mentally good a lot of the time. I'm not saying that's with everybody, but they look like they will. Um, I think if you've got a player who's not sticking to it, who's not doing it, it it's providing evidence of them not doing it and demonstrating evidence as to why that will hold them back. Again, I think that's easier said than done, but I, I'm, but I think you've got to go down that path. I think the second way to do to do that is to let them get away with it. Um, and I think certainly at the adult elite level, you have to be a little bit flexible on that. I think that you've got to, at the adult elite level, I think, and maybe even the developing elite level, it might be college. Maybe you've got to let them get away with it because you've got to appreciate there are individual differences. There are individual differences in personality. There are individual differences in ability. And I think that if you've got a player and I'm talking about one player. I'm not talking about loads. I'm talking about a player who is so good. A Zidane, a Messi. Then you've got to have good, honest conversations with your leaders, with your senior players, and get counsel from them, what they feel. I think that that's so important. I think that having communication with your leaders, your senior players, and seeing what's acceptable for them. What is it acceptable that this player contravenes our values, contravenes the behaviors that are underpinned by those values? Is this player, is the player so good that we'll allow that? If this player, if they believe no, then they believe no, and they you empower them to drive that. You empower them, you empower Lionel Messi to buy into a game face. He definitely should. You empower Zidane to buy into a game face. You empower Wayne Rooney at Derby at the moment to buy into a game face. I think the best thing that you can do is have a, a, a value-driven culture that's developed by your, your players, your people, your team, because they can drive that for you. And then I think individuals get away with less. I think if you want to let them get away with it, it's okay, all right, but but we need the performances from you. Um, I think if you're talking about 14, 15 year olds, go and find another club. If if you're elite forming, if you're just if it's just participative, then it's participative. It's a part if it's 15 year olds participating recrea recreational, as you might call it in the states, it doesn't really matter, does it? But if it's a, an elite forming, say at the youngest level of 14, 15, 16 and onwards, then you probably as a, as a, as a, as a coach want to decide what your psychosocial processes are. And if players aren't going to adhere to those, then you've got to ask whether, you know, you want that player in your club. Uh, Mario was asked about. Does it get to a point in the team if they've been coached by the same coach, by the same players and it's successful, the changing room almost runs on autopilot by the senior players? Is that is that what you're saying, that it shouldn't run on autopilot? Or are you saying that that's, a, that's an effective cultural uh, growth or whatever you want to call it? That's yeah. a great debate to have. Um, let's pluck figures out the air. I'm going to be naughty here and pluck a figure out the air. 80-20. I think if you've got an experienced group of players um, that are well, 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 well rounded, well, well coached, you know, 80% of it is going to be uh, on on autopilot, if that's the word to use. They're just going to do these things on habit. Uh, I think 20% of it needs to be done deliberately 
um, through whether it's uh, deliberate engagement in process, reinforcement, posters, um, <clears throat> conversation about it. Um, I, I, I think that still has to be there. Excellence, you could call it excellence. Yes, excellence is a habit, but excellence isn't just an unconscious habit. It's a deliberate habit. And this has to be reinforced um, all the time. Not everything all the time. That's not what I'm saying. But it's making sure you're, you're deliberately doing the same things. Otherwise, you slip. And when you slip, that's when you're that's when you're going to die so if you if you're if you're going to you know if you're going in and part of your coaching process is to ask good open questions to check understanding for your game model bang i mean i never see that i never ever ever see that get that guy I never ever see and also it doesn't exist i'm probably there's a whole host we've got 172 online right now whole host of coaches do this but if you think that you want players to go out to execute your game model I often see instruction, directive coaching. This is what I want to see. I never necessarily see an open question. What is it that you're going to do today with relation to the game model? What is it that you're doing? You know, what are the responsibilities in your role? Tell me about that. Here's this poster of uh, team shape, etc. our pattern of play. Tell me about that. Take me through that. Test for understanding. Anyway, that's an aside. But I'm saying that because that's the coaching process. That's an effective coaching process, right? So you need to make sure you're on top of that. Are you doing that all the time? If you're going to do it, you're probably going to do it. All, got to do it all the time. What are you engaging in? What you, that you're going to deliberately engage in all the time? There's absolutely in experienced teams. There's going to be a lot of good stuff that they're doing naturally, but don't take that for granted. Do not take that for granted. In my opinion, that's just my opinion, Gary. Is it better to take the result completely away from it than have consistent processes, or you know, do we pay respect to the result that that's, you know, at the elite level, that's that's just the reality of it? Embrace. Yep. Okay. So I caught uh, half of that again. I'm afraid, but I, 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 you know, you said about result. So let me talk about outcome. Um, I, I think that. I don't think there's anything wrong and please excuse me if I'm answering this question incorrectly because I only caught half of this, but I don't think there's, because obviously I've used the term process a lot. I don't think there's anything wrong with a coach talking about winning, but I think where coaches aren't vociferous enough, don't reinforce enough is what I, I would call it linkages, linking winning with performance process and winning with mindset process. So we can talk, we can stand there we can say, we're here to win today. We're here to win. Let's be passionate about winning. What are we here to do? We're here to win. Um, bottom line is we've got to win. That's the bottom line. I've heard all that stuff over the years at every level of English football, nonstop. Fine. Okay, great. And I, I don't think that's a wrong message. But if you isolate that, then I don't think it's that powerful. Because we know the bottom line is at the competitive level, we're there to win. It's like how are we going to win? So to me, it's we're here to win. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do that. We've each got an individual performance process. We've each got an individual mindset process. We've got a team process here. We're going to commit to that. We get this process right. We get this process right. As individuals and as a team, we give ourselves a great chance to win, to high perform and subsequently win. We get the process right. We high perform. And the other team play really well and, and we lose, then we lose. But, and you might not choose to say that as a coach, but if we get this performance process and individual mindset process right as individuals and as a team, wow, we would give ourselves a great chance to win today. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about being involved in that. I'm excited about working on that with you as individuals and as a team. I'm excited about us executing on that. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to help. And Gary, as always, your work is awesome. So uh, great to connect. Brilliant. Dan, thank you so much. This has been brilliant.